Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast where we're going to focus on a nightmare series case called the metabolic acidosis nightmare. This case study is uh, a true case that uh, I came across and really it was the thought process of trying to do a case study on the hypothermic patient, expanding on the last podcast we did where we looked at the hypothermic patient and specifically looking at the hyper case state and using that potassium level as a gauge for morbidity and mortality. Do you work the patient or do you not? But then when I looked at this overall case and I, I identified all the different elements, there's so many aspects to this case, I thought it would be a perfect segue to the previous podcast where we can then also focus on that metabolic acidosis and everything that encompasses this type of patient scenario. Objectives, we're going to really look at the introductory case study thoroughly. We're going to discuss the differential diagnosis areas that we want to focus on. We're going to analyze resuscitation factors, and we're going to analyze metabolic acidosis thoroughly. We're going to look at all the parameters. We're going to look at what supports our, our thought process, and then where, where is our treatment mindset going? Here's our case. We have a 65-year-old male presented in the ED after being found down by family. Uh, EMS transported this patient emergently, priority one to the closest emergency department. He had some shortness of breath, visibly working hard to breathe, and was very lethargic. His past medical history encompassed heart failure, stage three kidney failure, and he's had blood in his stool over the last three to four weeks. Current medication, as you can see, he's on a beta blocker, he's on that ACE inhibitor, Lasix, he's on metformin, and he's on warfarin. Hemodynamically, he is very unstable. 60 over 20 on a BP. His heart rate is 56, respiratory rate of 36. Again, to Kipnik. They do a tympanic temperature check, and his temp is 31.5 degrees Celsius. End tidal CO2 currently is at 23 based on a side stream nasal cannula reading. So when we look at this, just from this standpoint, obviously we have some significant history, pretty pronounced medication list, and this patient is definitely unstable and sick. As they transport this patient, they place him on the monitor, and as you can see, he's in a junctional rhythm. His mentation slowly changes and they notice that he converts into a third degree heart block. Shortly after converting to a third degree heart block, the patient goes asystolic and into cardiac arrest. They start resuscitation. They already had an IV established. They gave one milligram of epi, obviously with concurrent chest compressions. Airway management is started based on BLS, BVM ventilations. They end up giving an amp of sodium bicarb, calcium chloride, and they have ROSC after 10 minutes. They arrive at the hospital. Once the ED team starts working this patient up, they do get an ABG. ABG, as you can see, is significant. PH of 6.63, a PACO2 of 27, bicarb of 8, and a base excess of negative 15. His labs are, again, very, very ominous. He's got a sodium and chloride that are fairly normal, 142 on the sodium, 104 on our chloride. He has a really high lactate at 16, glucose of 48. Creatinine is significantly elevated at 9.9. .9. His H&H is terrible. Hemoglobin of 6 grams per deciliter. INR of greater than 8.6. He's got a K of 9.1 and a current anion gap of 30. Again, when we look at this patient from just a hierarchy view, he is definitely sick and he is unstable. But when you start looking at the laboratory values and you start thinking about differential diagnosis, there are a lot of different factors that we can start working towards just based simply on the labs. Now that we have a good idea of what's going on and we have an ABG, we have labs, 
patient has ROSC in place, resuscitation is continued, we need to also start thinking about the differential diagnosis paradigm. So let's start focusing on what we know. We know the patient is hypothermic. How do we treat that? Well, we know that any temperature greater than 30, we start treating. We start working on the, the rewarming phases of passive external, active external, and active internal. Currently 31.5 degrees Celsius, so we're above that 30 degrees Celsius mark. We talked about that in the last podcast. And remember, there is a specific lab that we always want to focus on, and that is a potassium. Is that potassium greater than 10 to 12? If it is, likely, you know, resuscitation efforts are going to be futile. Obviously, we already have ROSC in this patient, and we have a K of 9.1. So how do we treat this hypothermic patient? Well, we start with the simple aspects of rewarming, passive external, active external. And then we start moving towards that active internal rewarming. Why is the lactate so high in this patient? Would you expect a lactate to be this high in this type of patient? I just want us to ponder that as we move through this. And we're going to really focus on this as we progress through the case. Again, why is the anion gap so high? We know a normal anion gap that's corrected. Corrected meaning you, you're adding the potassium onto this calculation. If it's greater than 20, it's significant. So we're at 30 for this patient. What does that tell us? And is that an ominous finding? Now let's look at our treatment considerations. We started off with hypothermia. We have to understand, even though we have a temperature greater than 30, we have to continue moving upward. We don't want an after drop situation. We have a post cardiac arrest situation. We have to continue to focus on airway breathing circulation. Advanced airway management is going to be the key mechanical ventilation making sure that we're sedated well, we have good pain management in place. Do we have hemodynamic instability taken care of? Do we have vasopressors, inopressors, pure vasopressors considered and addressed? What do the laboratory values tell us? Can this give us any insight into you know, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours from now as far as our treatment methodology? Patient is anemic, hemoglobin of six grams per deciliter. We know that anything less than seven is treatable, so we need to address this. Is this going to impact your overall ability to resuscitate your patient? Well, sure it can. Is it going to be significant? Well, we're going to talk about how we look at that. The patient is in a severe metabolic acidosis. We're going to really dissect that ABG and look at why it is what it is. It's not so much about us fixing this disorder. It's about recognizing it and making sure our resuscitation is focused around our understanding of that metabolic derangement. The patient had a significantly high INR, definitely coagulopathic. What's causing that phenomenon? Hyperkalemic. Why would this patient be hyperkalemic? So as you can see, there is a lot of things going on with this patient. And finally, the patient is hypoglycemic. Why is that? Well, there's clear answers for every one of these. That's why I loved this case study is because as I started reading this, I thought, man, what an amazing case to really highlight all areas of resuscitation. It really, really makes us have to think about everything we do. And I think these are the types of cases that make you really well-rounded clinically if you can take care of patients at this level. So start off with the hypothermia mindset, right? We're not going to spend a lot of time here. We did our last podcast. If you haven't listened to that, go back. Episode 204. Core temperature right now is 31.5. We're above 30, as we talked about. We want to make sure as we continue rewarming, we focus on passive and active external rewarming, making sure we have warm heat blowing on the patient. We cover the patient with a blanket. We have, you know, uh, warm bottles, saline bags, hot packs in the axial areas, and then progressing to that active internal rewarming. But remember, we're, we're perfectly vasoconstricted. And as we rewarm that patient, that patient is going to have an after drop phenomenon where 
all that blood that is in the in the extremities gets moved into the core area and you can have a drop in temperature. Continue focusing on that airway management. Look at specifically the hemodynamic status. Blood pressure initially prior to arrest was 60 over 20. We cannot maintain any core perfusion to our brain and our liver and, and the core areas that we, we need. What medications could we use? Is epinephrine a, a choice for this patient? Could we go levofed for this patient? Is there a better medication? We're going to address all of these things as we continue. We have laboratory values to focus on. We have a lactate of 16. Remember, normal lactate is 2, up to 2, 0 to 2. The patient is hypoglycemic with a sugar of 48. Hemoglobin is 6, INR of 8.6, hyperkalemic at 9.1. And again, that anion gap is 30. And I want you to notice we have a serum bicarb of 17. That's going to be important later when we calculate that gap. So let's look at specifically that hyper-K state. What could be the causes? And I think when you look at this case study and you initially um, focus your attention on it, right, the heading of this case study, and you can find this case study in the show notes, it was all about the hyper-K state in a hypothermic patient. And as we remember from our previous podcast a few weeks ago, episode 204, we know that as our patients become critically cold, we start having cell damage and destruction. We have crystallization of those intra and extracellular fluids. But there's other reasons why this patient could have a hyper K state. The medications the patient's on could be a possible reason. We know that the INR was high. We know the creatinine was high. We're going to focus on each one of those but that creatinine being high is really where we're going to focus our attention. Could this patient have significant decreased renal excretion? And that's why we have a high case state. Could it be a medication-related issue? One clue to this, guys, is the patient's progression. Patient went from a junctional to a third-degree block to asystolic and ultimately was converted with sodium bicarbonate, calcium chloride. One of the misnomers that we often see in teaching in standard education is that in a hyper case state, you're going to see those hyper acute peaked T waves. And even though that is true in certain circumstances, that is not the standard. You're not going to see that most often. The most common approach that you're going to see from your heart's response to a hyper case state is Usually these arrhythmias, you're going to see VTAC. Usually VTAC, though, with a really wide QRS, usually greater than 0 0.20 in width. You're going to see a lower rate VTAC, probably in the 140s, 150s. You're going to see nuance at heart blocks, second degree type 2 and third degree heart blocks. Those are the standard types of, of patient encounters that you'll normally see with hyper case states. And they're going to respond favorably to sodium bicarbonate, calcium chloride. So just simply based on, on looking at it from that standpoint, was the hyper K state a result of cell damage? I would say probably not. Is it some type of pharmacology issue? Is it because this patient became sick and weak, stopped drinking fluid, stopped having normal urine output. So renal excretion was abnormal. We're going to look at this in more depth, but at this point, that hyper K state in my mind is not related to the hypothermia, but related to another cause. As we saw with the labs, the patient is significantly coagulopathic. The INR greater than 8.6 is significant. The likely cause of this is simply the hypothermia. Hypothermia is causing this phenomenon. Even though the patient's on warfarin, I would focus my attention on the resuscitation. 
rewarming this patient and reevaluating, rechecking the labs, you know, and, and seeing where we're at after a period of time. If there's still problems, then I would definitely consult with medical direction or, or a physician on scene at the hospital to evaluate, is there something else we can do? As we saw in the initial presentation, the patient had a lower GI bleed, had blood in the stool. Hemoglobin of six grams per deciliter is definitely significant. We have to understand though, the aspects of oxygen consumption. This patient definitely needs to be transfused. Type specific packed blood cell or whole blood transfusion would be optimal. But do we understand the consumption side? We know that the standard patient based on standard body mass index and standard delivery We'll just say on average delivers about 550 mils of oxygen every minute. And we consume about 100 to 120 mils. That's a 20% debt to income ratio. And really, we start getting into trouble when we start having our body in influx. We start having some type of stress response. In a normal homeostasis, we can actually deliver oxygen very efficiently all the way down to 4 grams per deciliter. Remember, 98% of all the oxygen that we carry in our body is stored on our hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is the biggest factor in the delivery of oxygen. Couple that with a proper cardiac output, and that is what is defined as DO2, the delivery of oxygen every single minute. So we definitely need to replace this. We definitely need to understand the impact of overall resuscitation from a global perspective. And start that warm blood. Again, it needs to be warmed. You need to flash warm it with some type of warmer. Now let's define and look at this metabolic disorder. If you were like me and you looked at that pH, you were a little bit taken aback. And that is a significantly low pH, 6.63. PaCO2 of 27, bicarbonate 8, base excess of 15. What does that tell us? Is that just a factor of the hypothermia? Is it a factor of the cardiac arrest situation? What caused that derangement to be so bad? Now let's break down this disorder. As we started out, we have a pH of 6.63. We're going to teach this based on the first middle last name methodology. Our first name is very simple. It's either compensated, meaning our pH falls between 7.35 and 7.45 or uncompensated, meaning our pH falls outside of 7.35 or 7.45. So if it's less than 7.35, it's uncompensated. If it's greater than 7.45, it's uncompensated. So our first name in this example is going to be uncompensated because it falls outside of that perfect range of 7.35 to 7.45. The next is looking at the last name. The last name is also going to be derived from the pH. And now we're really looking at it from the specifics of is this a reflection of acidosis or alkalosis? What we do in this example is we take that pH range of 7.35 to 7.45 and we bring it closer together. We're, we're more finite in looking at this. And we say, okay, a perfect pH is 7.4. If my pH is less than 7.4, we're showing an acidosis. If my pH is greater than 7.4, we're showing an alkalosis. And so if we specifically look at this, we know we're less than 7.4. And so our last name is going to be acidosis. So we, at this point, have two thirds of the answer just simply based on the pH. We haven't even looked at anything related to our respiratory side or our metabolic side. So now let's look at our middle name. And our middle name, guys, is really telling us the story. What's, what's causing this phenomenon? And what I like to do is I want to go right to the bicarb. I want to know immediately, is my bicarb abnormal? And for me, it's just much easier to get to the root cause. If I know my bicarb is abnormal, it gives me a good foundation of, okay, now I can look at my CO2 from a compensation perspective. And so if we go to our bicarb, we say, okay, our middle name, bicarb range is 22 to 26. We know that's normal. It's a reflection of alkali. If it's greater than 26, that's a reflection of more alkali. So we'd be more alkalotic. We'd have a kidney involvement, right? Because we're not inside the range of 22 to 26. If we're less than 22, 
Conversely, that's a reflection of acidosis. And again, we still have kidney involvement. So if that bicarb falls outside of that 22 to 26, we immediately label this a metabolic derangement. And so that's exactly what we have here is we have a bicarb less than 22 telling us we have less alkali, more acid, and we have a metabolic acidosis. So at this point, just based on simply looking at the pH, looking at the pH from compensated, uncompensated, acidosis, alkalosis, and looking at the bicarb from the specifics of metabolic versus normal, we have a uncompensated metabolic acidosis. How does the CO2 play into this? Well, the important thing to understand is our body's normal ability to compensate is simply based on our respiratory and kidneys moving in opposite directions. And you got to go back to our standard buffering systems. We have our carbonic buffering system, and that buffering system is working behind the scenes, and it's metabolizing all that CO2 from the tissues and combining that CO2 with water, and that those two molecules come together and they form carbonic acid, and the carbonic acid splits off into hydrogen and bicarb. And that's what fluctuates our pH. And then when we specifically look at the respiratory side, respiratory buffering system is looking at, okay, we have all these, this hydrogen floating around. We have all this excess free floating bicarb. Hey, we got to do something. And so it combines those two together. It moves the opposite direction on the acid base formula forms carbonic acid that doesn't like to stay in that state, which splits off into CO2 that can be exhaled and water that can be evaporated. And so in this example, we have a PaCO2 of 27, a normal PaCO2 range of 35 to 45. We know CO2 is a frank acid. It's a strong acid. And so anything greater than 45 means we have excess acid. Anything less than 35 means we have a decreased amount of acid or more alkali. And that's exactly what we see here. We see a patient that's in an uncompensated metabolic acidosis, but that has compensation. The patient is breathing fast. And if you remember from the initial vitals, patient was breathing at 36 times a minute. That is likely their ability to compensate. So what does that lead us to say? Well, this patient has a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. Thing we have to remember because that CO2 is showing alkalotic and the kidneys are showing acidotic, those two are moving opposite of each other. As the kidneys show more reflection of acid, the respiratory system should show more reflection of alkali and they're counterbalancing each other. That respiratory buffering system is making sure that we don't have a more significant drop in our pH. Why is this important? We have to be able to understand this patient's overall metabolic arrangement. If they're in a partially compensated state, how we approach minute ventilation, how we approach the overall resuscitation is essential. And we have to have the clues. We have to have the understanding to make good decisions. And as we move through this case, we'll highlight what those decisions should be. When we look at metabolic disorders and we start thinking about this from a, a, a wide optic, a great way to really start weeding through the causes of metabolic derangements is to specifically look at gold mark. And I've talked about this in other podcasts, in other teachings. We'll go through this very rapidly, but this is a great mnemonic. And so the first is going to be our gold. First is G for glycols. That means does the patient have any toxicity related to ethylene or propylene glycols? O is oxoproline. It's a metabolite broken down from acetaminophen. It's the acid content once it's broken down. So think about ingestion. The number one overdose for adult patients is actually acetaminophen. So when you think about an adult lethal dose, 7.5 to 10 grams at 500 milligrams a tablet, that's not that many tablets. L-lactate is excess lactate production, i.e. metformin toxicity. Hint, hint, hint. 
D is D-lactate. D-lactate is a, a byproduct of short bowel syndrome of Crohn's disease. Um, you'll see this in acetaminophen overdoses related to oxoproline breakdown. And this is a lab that has to be requested and drawn. And then we get into MARC, methanols. Has the patient ingested any solvents, window washer fluid, any de-icer fluid? You see this a lot in kids. Acetosilic acid, aspirin overdose. We've talked about this in other podcasts. Lethal doses of greater than 150 milligrams per kilo. But if you look at a bottle of baby aspirin, somebody dump a whole bottle of baby aspirin down the, the hatch, that's all it takes. Renal failure, specifically acute versus chronic. Acute is very simple, usually going to be a volume-related problem or pre-renal. But then you look at intrarenal, right? Is there a kidney issue? And post-renal, is there a problem with their bladder, the ureter, the prostate? And lastly, ketoacidosis, right? Is this patient a DKA patient? Does this patient have any alcoholism uh, tendencies? Do you see anything related to alcoholism? Is this patient a starvation uh, type of a patient? And you see a lot of times the alcoholic and the starvation going hand in hand. So these are just great ways of focusing your mind on areas that you could be missing. Now let's look at the cause and effect paradigm of lactate. Lactate of 16 millimoles per liter is significant. We have three possible causes. We have the hypothermia. Could the hypothermic process have caused this lactate? Possibly. Could the cardiac arrest and the post-arrest resuscitation, could that have caused the lactate to increase? Well, it could have. Is there a toxicity related to the underlying reason why this patient is in this state. Very likely. We just saw a clue in the Goldmark mnemonic. We saw in the very beginning of this case, this patient's medication list. And I think that is the key is the toxicity is the one that really sticks out. The hypothermia is not going to cause a lactate in most cases to this level and neither is a post-arrest situation. There's some other clues, though, that really strengthen this argument. And we go back to the medications. If it's a toxicity problem, the three medications that really stick out would be the metformin, the atenolol, or the lisinopril. And we know that metformin has a history of lactic acidosis based on just how that mechanism of action works. It's usually not a medication problem. It's, it's a cascading of events that cause these patients to decline. And so metformin would be my number one thought process moving forward. That's why this lactate is as high as it is. When we look at metformin, we ask ourselves, how did metformin cause lactic acidosis? What's the cause and effect? Metformin has nothing to do with insulin regulation, but it has everything to do with gluconeogenesis and the amount of gluconeogenesis in the liver. And what it does is it activates an enzyme called AMPK. And that AMPK enzyme is responsible for inhibiting gluconeogenesis. Glucodeogenesis has a byproduct. It has three byproducts. It's got lactate, alanine, and glyceryl. And because of those byproducts, guys, it causes an increased level of lactate production. And when we look at that increased level of lactate production, we couple that with poor fluid intake, poor excretion. We start having this excessive buildup of lactate in our body. And that's what leads to that severe lactic acidosis. And we know that is likely what leads to these partially compensated metabolic acidosis states. As we continue with our investigation, we look at the anion gap. What causes that anion gap to become high? What information does that give us? Does that give us any type of clue? Can we make better treatment choices based on our understanding? Well, absolutely. And so the thing that we have to understand is really what is an anion gap? And it's the difference between unmeasured anions and cations, simply put. And so how is that calculated? 
Well, on a standard lab, they're going to do it two ways. Every hospital is going to be different. You're going to see it corrected. In some places, you may just see uncorrected. We're going to do a corrected version. And so an anode gap is the difference between those unmeasured positive and negative charges, specifically our sodium and our potassium. Those are positively charged. Those are those cations. And our negative charges, our anions, are chloride and bicarb. And so how would we do this? Here's the standard anion gap formula. This is a great way to get insight into somebody's overall level of sickness. If you don't have an ABG, you can do an anion gap. You have a standard Chem 7 panel. Uh, you have all of these labs available and you can identify very quickly, hey, this patient's likely in a metabolic acidosis based on my gap. So how do we do this? First thing I want to point out, guys, is we have our sodium. It's going to be outside the main bracket. So we have chloride plus bicarb. Well, what does that bicarb mean? That bicarb, guys, is a reflection of serum bicarb. It is not the same bicarb on the ABG. And so the only way for the lab to measure serum bicarb is to measure the CO2 bound to that bicarb. Because you got to remember the acid-base formula, how it moves Back and forth, CO2 starts on the right or on the left, depending on how you, you draw it out, it eventually ends up as bicarb. And so that is a reflection of serum bicarb. That's going to be the serum bicarb reflection on that Chem 7. So how are we going to do this? Plug the numbers in from the labs. We have a 104 chloride plus our serum bicarb of 17. We're going to do the parentheses first. So 104 plus 17. We move down, 104 plus 17 is 121. We're going to then subtract that 121 from the sodium of 142 and add our potassium, and we're going to get a gap of 30. That's how we would calculate that out. That gives us the ability to say, hey, this patient has a gap corrected and greater than 20. That's significant. We know this patient likely is in a significant metabolic acidosis. And if we continue our investigation, we look at the ABG and specifically that base excess. The base excess gives us really all the elements that, that we could possibly see as a factor in why this metabolic arrangement is as bad as it is. And I always like to think of it as this. A base excess norm is plus or minus two. And if we're talking about excess base, we're talking about excess alkali. So if we have a positive number, a base excess of two, for example, we have excess alkali by two. If we have a base excess of negative two, we have two excess acids because remember, we're talking about a base excess. In this example, this ABG is showing a base excess of negative 15. If a normal base excess is plus or minus two, what I want you to take from that is we have to figure out where that excess 13 acids are coming from. There are 13 acids coming from somewhere that's causing this metabolic arrangement to be what it is. That's what's causing this partially compensated metabolic acidosis. And so really these six items are keys to deciphering what that base excess is all about. Start off with our sodium and chloride. Sodium and chloride are strong acids. We're going to look at that specifically. Albumin, guys. Albumin is something that we're not going to get into in this podcast. I've talked about it in other podcasts. Albumin is a weak acid. We know albumin is that protein found in our blood that maintains three quarters or more of the oncotic pressure needed in our capillaries in our vessels, but we can actually have a falsely high or falsely low base excess based on the albumin level. So albumin factoring in here is really a correction. We're not going to worry about that for this example. So what we're going to focus on is looking at the lactate. We're going to look for any ketones and any toxic alcohols. And the way I like to think about this is I start from the top and I work my way down. If I find problems related to where those extra acids are in the very top 
i.e. sodium chloride, that is not as big of a deal. As I move down that list, when I get down to toxic alcohols, we're talking about significant problems. And so I always look at that as a, a list of severity. The top is less severe than the bottom. Now let's break down this base excess. Let's look at our normal numbers. The first thing I want to start with is, again, we have a base excess of negative 15. We have excess base in a negative number, meaning we have extra acids. But we could also say we have a base deficit of 15. So we have a deficit amount of base of 15. Again, a norm is plus or minus 2. So you could say, hey, we're looking for 13 marbles. And I always use marbles because it's, it's easy to, to use marbles in a, in a live teaching scenario. When we look at our sodium and chloride, we're not going to really look at the range, but a perfect number right there in the middle of those ranges. I want you to remember this, a sodium of 140, chloride of 102. And why is that significant? Because those are strong acids, as I said. And we have to be able to identify a measurement called the SID, the strong ion difference. And that strong ion difference between the two in a normal patient is 38. And I want you to think of that SID as a, a temperature gauge. If the SID increases, the patient becomes more alkalotic. If the SID decreases, the patient becomes more acidotic. So it really is a gauge. The lower the SID drops, the more acid. The higher the SID goes above 38, the more alkali. So in this example, we have a SID of 38. Albumin, 4.5 to 5.5. We know that's a normal range. Lactate, less than 2. Ketones, we should not produce ketones, right? Unless you're dieting or, you know, you have alcoholism and you're not eating or drinking appropriately, you probably are going to have some ketone production. And then obviously tox alcohols. These are normal numbers. But for purposes of this example, let's look at this from what the lab showed us. And as I said, we're going to skip the albumin. We're going to remove that albumin and we're going to focus specifically on these five elements. So our sodium was 142, our chloride was 104. Again, we have a base excess of negative 15, a deficit of 15. So if we identify what the strong ion difference is, notice our difference is still 38. So what I want you to think about, okay, well, if my difference is 38, and that's what is giving me a reflection of really acid or alkali between those two strong acids, sodium and chloride, all we need to do is say, okay, well, if I have a SID of 38 as a, as a, a, a goal, I have a measured SID of 38, I'm going to subtract that and I have a SID of zero. So my base excess, my base deficit does not change related to the sodium and chloride. I have not found any problems related to sodium chloride that I could attribute to that base deficit. The next step is to analyze the lactate. And again, we have to think about what is a normal lactate. Normal lactate is two or less. And so we, we know, hey, we've got a lactate of 15 on this patient. Very, very simple. So we just take that two saying, okay, we're gonna give, give that patient two on a lactate. That means that we have an excess lactate of 13. And this is a very simple example. We simply take that lactate of 13 from the base deficit and we have a base deficit now of two, which would equal a base excess of negative two and that's a normal reflection. If we were to keep going and we did not find all of this base deficit within that lactate, we would then evaluate, does this patient have any ketone production? Does this patient have any toxic alcohols? So going back to Goldmark, saying, hey, is there any ethylene glycol poisoning, any propylene glycol, which is a, usually a derivative of long-standing sedation, or um, you can have this from dilantin administration, any benzodiazepines over long periods of time when you have poor kidney functions or liver, um, liver insufficiency. Do you have methanol toxicity? Do you have something from a toxicity standpoint? And that's where you get into the tox alcohols. 
In this example, we looked at sodium chloride, the SID was normal. We came down to the lactate, the lactate was a big, big portion of that. And we basically found out that, hey, the majority of this base excess, if not all of it, is simply based on the excess lactate production. And that goes right back to the metformin toxicity. So what are our key treatment targets? This patient is highly complex. There's a lot going on, but ultimately we still have to get our patient from point A to point B. Is focusing our resuscitation on antidote CO2 going to help us? What are our minute ventilation requirements for a patient in a partially compensated metabolic acidosis? pH is 6.63. A lot of you listeners may not have an ABG. You may not have point of care testing during transport. Some of you have epochs or iStats. So your information gathering is going to be really different based on who you're working for and where you're located. And so what I would always say is use those other tools. Get good at using the N on gap calculation. Identify where potentially my acid is coming from. Really have a hierarchy overview of differential like we went through. But ultimately, we have to be able to treat this patient from the standpoint of protecting the pH. This is a hot topic. This is a topic that it has been uh, discussed for years on how to set a minute ventilation for a patient in a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. And it's important to understand that a, that a DKA patient, for example, with a pH of 6.63 versus a Sepsis patient with a pH of 6.63 are completely different patients. And really from, from the data out there, the number of patients that you're going to get with a significant pH less than 7.1, we'll say, is very, very limited. Like you're not going to get these every single patient. We often teach this that any metabolic acidosis patient needs to have a minute ventilation requirement higher, but that is absolutely incorrect. And you have to look at these from specific standpoints. And most of them are going to be DK patients. They're going to be patients that are in the toxicity standpoint. This lactic acidosis from metformin toxicity is a great example. Ethanol poisoning, methanol poisoning, ethylene glycol poisoning, aspirin overdoses, you know, maybe some acetaminophen overdoses. Those are the types of patients that are going to need it more so than the standard sepsis patient. What's one way to evaluate this? Well, if you don't have any of these fancy parameters, you place this entitled CO2 on this patient when you get to the ED, we got to remember the mnemonic of the three Ps of entitled CO2. Number one, pulse. Do they have a perfusing pulse? Do they have a pulse at all? Number two, perfusion. If I have an entitled CO2, as we saw of 23, why is that? Is it because the patient is, is, is hyperventilating? Well, possibly. But we also have to remember that entitled CO2 is a reflection of perfusion, blood going around and around. And if our blood going around and around slows down, we start running out of gas, we start running on maybe a couple cylinders, the perfusion status is going to elicit a, a, a lower entitled CO2 number. So until you fix the perfusion, the entitled CO2 is not going to respond. And the, the point of this slide is to get you to think about this, not as focusing on a number, but more focusing on resuscitation. And the entitled is a reflection of your endpoint of resuscitation. Lastly, pH. We obviously in this patient have a pH of 6.63. They're in a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. But if you didn't have that information, what I want you to just understand is the last two, perfusion pH, until you can prove otherwise, those are the reasons why the entitled CO2 is low. And you do not lower minute ventilation in an attempt to raise entitled. That's where you start getting into trouble because every 10 point change in CO2, you have an opposite change of 0.08 in your pH. And your pH is already in this patient 6.63. So how do we focus our attention? What ventilator you use, whether you're using the Hamilton, the Ravel, the Impact, the EMV Plus, lots of ventilators out there. It comes down to, we can have 
a ventilator, we can have a BVM, but ultimately we have to understand the medicine. We have to understand that, hey, our patient has a certain compensation level that we have to maintain. Here are some ideas, guys. These are just ideas. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. If you go all the way back to our early teaching, you go back to 2008, nine MCRIP podcast. Uh, Scott Weingart advocated 240 mils per kilo per minute for any metabolic acidosis patient that's in partial compensation. As I moved through education at Air Methods and started talking to multiple medical directors and did a lot of stuff with Dr. Dan Davis, we came up with 160. Why 160? Well, I'll be honest with you, the 160 was more just overall thought process. It was years of experience, multiple physicians talking and feeling like that was a more appropriate number, but there's no science to back that number. I want to emphasize that. And so there's not a one size fits all. It's not black or white. Remember it's 50 shades of gray. Tidal volume range, start at six mils per kilo. Go up if you, if you feel like you need to go down. If your plateau pressures or pips are high respiratory rate based on the 160 mils per kilo per minute is 26. So again, what was the patient doing prior to arrest? Well, the patient was breathing 36 times a minute. Try to calculate in your mind, what was that overall minute of inhalation and then get somewhere close. Peep of five for this patient. There's really nothing that's giving us the thought of severe hypoxia, right? Be conservative, but remember that PEEP is your friend. High level treatment, guys, is really focusing on airway, making sure we have a good secure ET tube, maintaining that entitled CO2, watching how that number changes with your resuscitation, focusing on perfusion. Remember the metabolic derangement is something that happened over time. It's not going to be fixed overnight. It's not going to be fixed in your transport. Continue rewarming the patient. Continue focusing on good mechanical ventilation maneuvers. Don't forget the hemodynamic support. This patient was critically, critically low on that pressure. Don't forget to resuscitate the entire patient. And always go back to the triangle method, and that is assess volume, SVR, and heart rate. Do we have too much volume or are we depleted? Is our heart rate too fast? Is it too slow? Is it compensating normally? And do we have normal SVR? Is it vasodilated or is it constricted? And that is a great way to focus your attention on the pharmacology, the fluid management, and adjusting your thought process. And then lastly, obviously, this patient is a great candidate for ECMO and or dialysis. If they're on ECMO, they're probably not going to need, need to be dialyzed, but that is exactly what this patient needs. Guys, this case study supports a global resuscitation mindset. It really is a broad understanding of patho, very complex case, a very difficult case to manage. Identifying those metabolic arrangements really are the key. And it's not so much, again, about your ability to completely change the path of the patient. It's about maintaining what you have, understanding what you have, and making good decisions. I can't stress it enough for paramedics listening. If, it, if labs are not your strength, it is going to add a completely upper level of thought process and critical thinking to your tool bag when you start understanding labs at a high level. Patients with multiple etiologies, they can be really hard to treat. And knowing when and to what extent to approach these patients and how to focus your resuscitation is essential. Start with things you know and build on it. A patient with partially compensated metabolic acidosis presentations can be difficult to manage, but remember, they're very isolated. They're not as many as we think. Really, it's about identification, understanding, hey, this is likely what's going on. You don't always need an ABG. There's lots of ways to be able to identify this. And ultimately, guys, this case is a, a case, again, we'll put the case study in the show notes, but ultimately, this patient survived. 
neurologically intact, ended up having to go on ECMO. Uh, and uh, once the patient was on ECMO for a few days, started really responding well. And really, it was a multitude of problems. Patient started not feeling well, started having poor PO intake, having weakness related to the blood in the stools, continued to take medications because patients were programmed to do that, poor renal excretion, lactic acidosis ensued, patient became obtunded, could not really function, hypoglycemic, and ultimately got so severely hypothermic. And so it really was just this, this big circle that continued downward. So when we think about a patient like this, it is overwhelming, but if we continue to, to build on our understanding and we focus on each specific system, each specific lab, understanding things to a greater level, again, it's not so much what we can do all the time, it's about what we understand. And sometimes knowledge leads to us understanding that we may not be able to do certain things, or maybe it's better to wait. So as always, please reach out to me, eric.bauer at flatbridgehead.com. I would love to hear your comments. If you have any new cases you want to talk about, uh, we would love to showcase them. And again, I will talk to you soon.